I'll be uh, going uh, directly to my case. Uh, actually, I'll be talking about a case uh, which I perceive was a difficult thrombolysis for me, and uh, this patient was thrombolysed a good uh, one year back. Still, I wanted to share the experience. So, okay, uh, can we move on to the next slide? Yeah. So she is a sixty-five year old female who was a known uh, who is a known case of hypertension, hypothyroidism. Uh, dilated cardiomyopathy with a low ejection fraction of only 15%. Uh, she also had the comorbidity of uh, chronic kidney disease and ulcerative colitis. She had presented to a hospital with the chief complaints of acute onset left-sided weakness with slurring of speech, which, have, which was noted since 2 p.m. She had reached our hospital at 3.30 p.m., that is around 90 minutes uh, after the onset of Victor's. And uh, among the medicines she was already taking, which was uh, perceived to be important uh, from my side, was that she was on a costrin 75 mg, uh, etorvastatin 20 mg, uh, thyronom 125 micrograms, uh, azathioprine 100 mg per day, and mesocol 800 mg per day. The last two medicines being given for her ulcerative colitis. Uh, next, please. Uh, so on examination, a rapid examination was done, suspecting an acute stroke, and uh, she was found to have normal vitals. There was dysarthria, gross dysarthria. Uh, there was subtle right-sided facial weakness, uh, which was not so very, uh, uh, which was not uh, very glaring or very prominent. It was uh, plus-minus type of uh, right-sided facial weakness, and the power was definitely uh, weak. And her left upper limb was three by five, and left lower limb was even weaker at two by five. Uh, next, please. So uh, we have suspected that it, uh, it is an acute ischemic stroke. Per se, because uh, right side facial was plus minus, we did give it a thought that it could be a brainstem stroke or, uh, or, if, uh, or if the facial palsy was uh, subtle and it was uh, minimal, we could neglect it and it was suspected it could be a, uh, a right MCA stroke also. So we... Uh, uh, ordered an emergent NCCT had to be done, and uh, the MCA territories were looking fairly, uh, fairly well uh, represented, uh, with no obvious hypodensity which could be made out on the uh, on the plain CT image. Uh, next, please. So uh, we had contemplated that as she is in the window period and with a disabling stroke with a NHS of more than uh, uh, with an NHS of around five, but a disabling stroke. We had uh, we had made up a mind that we would be going for IV thrombolysis of this patient, uh, irrespective of the location of the clot or irrespective of the uh, irrespective of the nature of the nature of the uh, vessels uh, before uh, uh, before doing the thrombolysis. So we shift, uh, while we were shifting her back from CT suite for initiating IV thrombolysis, the patient had two episodes of vomiting. Uh, she became drowsy and fell off the stretcher, bumping her head onto the floor. Uh, she was wheeled back to the emergency room. Uh, vitals were assessed and sensorium was reassessed. Now she had become drowsy. Uh, she had become drowsy, but she was arousable and she was responding to verbal commands, so intermittently. And the power of left upper and lower limb had also reduced to 2 by 5. Initially, only the lower limb was uh, uh, graded at 2 by 5. Now, even the upper limb was at 2 by 5. Uh, next, please. So, uh, uh, next slide, please. So, after re evaluation, uh, we, uh, I think you've skipped one slide. Mm. You need to go back one more slide. So, this is the next slide after this. Okay, yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. So, uh, initially, because there was a history of recent head trauma and she had become drowsy, it was imperative on our, uh, on, it was imperative as a clinician on my mind to rule out any hemorrhage which might have happened or uh, any such uh, thing which could have been a major contraindication for thrombolysis. Thus, uh, I was not very comfortable in initiating a thrombolysis in a patient who had just sustained a major head injury. Being uh, a fall from a stretcher from a good height of two to three feet was deemed as uh, as a significant uh, as a significant occurrence from my side. And thus, she was shifted back to the imaging room. This time, the option was there for me whether I could uh, do a CT scan or, or just to rule out an uh, just to rule out a brain hematoma, which could have been uh, or a traumatic contusion, which might have. Uh, which might have been picked up on the CT, or I could have got a MRI brain done. 
the reason i chose mri brain was because earlier also because of this uh, settled right side facial weakness which was pricking my mind i thought it could be a brain stem pathology also so why not to get a mri brain uh, the few sequences which i needed dwi flare and swi so an mri brain was done and initially uh, uh, our residents were there and uh, it was initially reported that uh, the dwi is only showing the right uh, hyper right hyperidal uh, dwi hyperintensity uh which was not at all seeming plausible to me so i asked uh, the adc images to be sent and uh, this is what the adc maps showed next slide so the adc did show uh mid brain uh, the pons uh, the pons the right side of the pons was uh, was low on adc maps and uh, this was quite collaborating with the weakness of the left upper limb low limb and uh, the subtle right side facial weakness which was uh, which was plus minus to be honest with but uh, this was being explained by that and uh, thus i went back to the console and uh, recheck the dwi films uh, can you go to the next slide please there was an evolving in path as we can see there was the the intensity of the two uh, of the two uh, hemisphere of the two sides of the pons was not at all symmetrical there was an evolving in part in the right side of the pons which was uh, which was probably missed by the uh, residents and uh, this this was uh, deemed to be the the exact cause of the patient becoming uh, hemiplegic on the left side and probably also going into lapsing into drowsy state because of the uh, because of the involvement of the brain stem structures uh, next slide flare was only showing a uh, hyper intensity corresponding to the right parietal uh, lobe infarct and uh, the otherwise the flare uh, images were negative for the midbrain infarct and uh, they were also uh, uh, there was no other obvious hyper intensity which was to be noted on the flare images next please SW images were also reviewed just to look at the possibility of any hematoma which might have occurred or any contusions. Uh, there was uh, there was no evidence of any contusions on the MRI or any evidence of major IC bleed or uh, subdural hematoma or uh, even a small subarachnoid hemorrhage which may have been a contraindication to IV thrombolysis. The only thing which made me go suspect uh, this uh, the presence of any IC bleed or any uh, subdural bleed was the presence of the patient becoming uh, suddenly drowsy after the fall that was what alerted me that i should be alert to that possibility that there could be a bleed also and uh, that is why i opted for this uh, whole exercise of getting the repeat imaging so while we were at it uh, i thought before thrombolysis it would be a, uh, i would just uh, go go and get the angio also done so the top mri brain uh, top angio was done of uh, no please go to that yeah and that showed that the basilar was occluded uh, hardly proximal 0.5 cm of the basilar was seen and the left vertebral artery was also very poorly formed or poorly visualized although it's a top image so not be over reading but uh, definitely there was a cut off uh, at the proximal basilar artery itself so this did entail that a large portion of her uh, brain stem was at risk for further ischemia and uh, she uh, may have uh, cardio uh, cardio or respiratory depression also and uh, might have uh, might have uh, had a uh, had a further worsening and uh, even the cerebellar territory could be at risk for infarction so then uh, finally uh, next slide please <clears throat> next slide yeah so the question uh, finally um, uh, was towards resolution that i whether i should be initiating iv thrombolysis or no the main contraindications which were going through my mind was a recent fall 30 minutes before uh, can go back ulcerative colitis and chronic kidney disease although it has been discussed at multiple forums still patient uh, still people uh, even clinicians like me are a bit apprehensive in using the full dose of uh, thrombolytic agent for chronic kidney disease and was the flare positivity in one of the dwa positive lesions a reason for considering uh, for withholding iv thrombolysis so uh, next slide please so as uh, we can see from this uh, ahasa guideline if there is a severe head trauma within 3 months 
then only uh, IV alteplase is contra contraindicated, and it should be a severe head trauma, which should either lead on to a uh, uh, which should either lead on to a breathing complication in the brain or or to a traumatic contusion in the brain. As a patient, uh, which was uh, as a patient had none of these, which were excluded by the most recent imaging, so uh, this was not a contraindication, and uh, we could go ahead with the thrombolysis from at least uh, this point of view. Uh, next slide, please. With regards to, uh, as I told you, SWA was done and it showed no evidence of IC oblique EC date. Next slide, please. So ulcerative colitis, uh, whether that is a contraindication or no, not, it is not routinely that we as neurologists see patients of ulcerative colitis having an ischemic stroke. She had been on maintenance with azithioprine and mesogol, and there had been no active GI bleed for more than five years. So as we know, uh, only contraindication to IV thrombolysis is either a structural GA malignancy or recent bleeding event within 21 days of the stroke onset, uh, which is considered to be high risk from at least GI uh, point of view. So this was not a contraindication at all, and we could go ahead with the IV thrombolysis in this patient. Uh, next slide, please. What about CKD? As AHAS guideline itself says, end stage renal disease patients who are on hemodialysis and have a normal APTT, IV alteplase is recommended. And uh, however, those with elevated APTT may have elevated risk for hemorrhagic complications. Thus, there was a trial in which lower dose of uh, uh, alteplase was being used, that is, instead of 0.9 mg per kg, they had used 0.6 mg per kg. Similar thing could be contemplated for tenecteplase also, rather than 0.25 mg, we could have used 0.2 mg. But uh, because uh, this patient uh, was not on hematalysis and uh, she had uh, no obvious uh, hemorrhagic complications which had been, which had been described, uh, uh, IV thrombolysis was considered for this patient. Uh, next slide, please. With regards to flare positivity, uh, I think I discussed it in last of my presentation also. The patient being a known case of dilated cardiomyopathy with low ejection fraction. The presumed etiology was cardioembolic, which resulted in a shower of emboli. And in this respect, the flare positive lesion in right parietal lobe was a silent lesion, and the acute symptomatic lesion was M1 involving the right side of pons. And thus, IV thrombolysis was uh, contemplated and rather uh, forced for. Next, please. So now the question comes as such as a major vessel occlusion. This yes, artery has been occluded. Uh, should we stick to either IVT or purely mechanical uh, thrombectomy, or should we go for bridging thrombolysis and go for IVT or mechanical thrombectomy? So of late, there have been multiple studies and multiple uh, neuroradiologists and some of our uh, neurologists who have also turned uh, into intervention. They are also of the opinion that it, if the intervention can be done at that time itself in the hospital, IV thrombolysis should be avoided. That is what uh, their personal opinion is. But if we are to go by trials per se, at present, we have evidence that bridging is the best. Uh, why I say that is because of this study from uh, which was published in the esteemed journal NEGM, in which, again, uh, they had compared endovascular thrombectomy with or without intravenous alteplase in acute stroke. Uh, uh, in this, uh, three, 12, three, uh, nearly similar patients were assigned to either thrombectomy alone and, uh, or, uh, and or endovascular thrombectomy preceded by IV thrombolysis. Uh, they had noted they noted that uh, endovascular thromb uh, thrombectomy alone was non inferior to combined uh, bridging thrombolysis with regard to the primary outcome, uh, but it was associated with lower percentages of patients with successful pre-perfusion before thrombectomy. For example, the pre-perfusion before thrombectomy was uh, seven percent in the bridging thrombolysis group, and it was only two point four percent in the uh, in the non uh, bridging group. And there was an overall also successful reperfusion, although the odds might not be great. But uh, if you have to go by percentages, even a five percent uh, difference does make uh, does argue well for uh, contemplating uh, bridging thrombolysis. For example, successful reperfusion was eighty four point five percent in the bridging group, whereas it was eighty percent in the mechanical thrombectomy group. We might be contemplated to think that there's a risk of hemorrhage uh, does increase, and uh, for that, I'll go to uh, the next slides. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this is another article which was published uh, in the journal Stroke, in which there another uh, meta-analysis was done with regards to bridging thrombolysis, achieving better outcomes in direct thrombectomy after large vessel occlusion. And uh, next, please. 
in this article also uh, it uh, the patients in the direct mt group were compared with the bridging thrombolysis group and they showed better functional independence let us say attain the mrs score of 0 to 2 at 90 days uh, the odds ratio of uh, mechanical uh, the odds ratio of bridging thrombolysis group attaining that was 1.43 as compared to mechanical thrombectomy alone and they also had a lower mortality at 90 days the odds ratio was uh, 0.67 and they also achieved a higher successful recanalization and the rate of uh, the odds ratio of that was also 1.23 with regards to symptomatic ich there was no significant difference between the occurrence of symptomatic ich between the two groups the odds ratio of being 1.01 so with the evidence we have at present although the studies are looking at uh, still they still continue to look at the possibility of direct mechanical thrombectomy over and above bridging thrombolysis but it, in my knowledge to the best of my knowledge uh, right now the best evidence we have is for bridging thrombolysis we should be attempting bridging thrombolysis before uh, we should be attempting bridging thrombolysis in patients who have uh, a large vessel occlusion provided they are eligible for same as of now i do uh, i do concur with this evidence at least uh, next please so uh, now uh, coming back to our patient the patient was thrombolyzed with tenecte place i use a full dose 0.25 mg per kg body weight uh, with being in a private setup the cost is always a big issue and the patient was non affording for mechanical thrombectomy and in spite of whatever we tried uh, the, uh, there was no way we could offer mechanical thrombectomy although i, I was quite pro that and uh, Uh, and really was uh, uh, I did want that uh, this patient should be uh, should undergo mechanical thrombectomy because the basal occlusion was the uh, taking at the back of my mind that she might go into uh, cardiac or respiratory arrest and medulla could be involved or uh, those were the things that were going in my uh, mind so eco again showed the same findings global lb hypokinesia dilated la and low ejection fraction MR angiogram as I showed had a filling defect in the basilar artery and rest of the major vessels were normal and Holter showed multiple runs of atrial fibrillation. Next slide, please. So post thrombolysis, uh, the infarction did involve the opposite uh, side of the pons also. It was a, uh, it was yeah, it it evolved uh, both the sides of the pons. And uh, the pili cerebellum was cleared, and the medulla oblongata and the midbrain structures were also preserved, as well as the PCA territory. Uh, next, please. The only aspect which came in the right superior cerebellar hemisphere, which was concordant with the mid to distal distal basal artery involvement of the of the at the MRNG. Next, please. the flare positivity was also in the same uh, region next please the angiogram was also repeated after thrombolysis and uh, as we can see the vessels had opened up and the pc was very well formed uh, was very well visualized the descending portion also and uh, the basal although the basal was still uh, uh, not uh, very fully uh, was not full patent but there was a but at least a flow was really established uh, next please so the patient had a good clinical outcome and improved by the time of discharge <coughs> excuse me she was discharged on nepixab and 5 mg twice a day this was done because she had still residual post stroke dysphagia uh and uh, by the time she came on uh, next follow up even that had resolved uh, after 3 weeks and uh, she was shifted, uh, shifted back to uh, uh because of the renal parameters also the dosage was kept at same i pick up and 5 mg or twice a day and uh, by the time of last follow up uh, she had mr score of 2 and nh of 1 could you go to the patient video please उठाइए अपने हाथ बस so, एक दो तीन चार पाँच छ सात आठ नौ दस नीचे कर लीजिए धीरे धीरे अभी वाला पैर उठाइए एक दो तीन चार पाँच छ सात आठ नौ दस नीचे कर लीजिए अब दूसरा पाँव उठाइए एक दो तीन 
चार पाँच छ सात आठ नौ दस Uh, go to the next slide. She had uh, ataxia, as evidenced by this video, uh, in both the lower limbs. Next one. I think you take that. Yeah. आपका नाम क्या है? सुरेंद्र खोर. आप कहाँ रहते हैं? इंदरपुरी में. क्या हुआ था आपको? पता नहीं बैठी हुई थी सोफे पर कर में चक्कर आ रहा था घर को. अच्छा फिर आपको कुछ याद है क्या हुआ था आपको को ले आए हॉस्पिटल अपनी आंखें कस के बंद करेंगे कस के बंद करिए दांत दिखाइए मुंह में हवा भरिए कोशिश करिए कोशिश करिए So she had uh, only residual yeah. ataxia, yeah. and uh, yeah, I think we can stop that video. The pre-thrombolysis video was not available uh, because of the rush, and uh, this is what I say to to my patients also that they have to grow through what you go through. So uh, that is what I had for my presentation today, and uh, I'll be most welcome for discussion in this one. Thank you, thank you. Doctor Call sir. Yeah. Uh, no, I think uh, uh, it's a very very good case and a uh, lot of learning in this patient. And I think uh, Satyan has really uh, analyzed it very nicely. And uh, definitely um, the contraindications we used to think few years ago. Those all have been relaxed now. Uh, ulcerative colitis, particularly if it is not actively bleeding, it's not a contraindication. And CKD definitely is not a contraindication. Uh, and um, about the flare, about the flare, there's one thing. Uh, I mean, it's good that you thrombolyzed, but you know, there is one. Uh, there is one problem in that flare that some people might have been little. Uh, scared to thrombolyze because of that flare phenomena. Because this has flare means that one of the uh, infarcts has happened before four hours, uh, which you yourself said. And the pontine one is the recent one, and the parietal one is probably come in a time zone which is earlier. So some people would say that uh, since so so that amounts to an infarct only, even if it's asymptomatic, but it amounts to an infarct. Uh, and some people may be scared to do it, but I think uh, it's a very soft contraindication. It's not a. There's still discussion going on that. Uh, uh, but but that could the, I, actually. I was thinking that was the only thing which were, and it's right that you didn't think about it, and it's right that you ignored that thing. Otherwise, this patient would have died from the basilar occlusion. And that's exactly what I'm saying. Uh, how we learn from these cases, but clearly this flare thing. When we see, we should not put so much of importance to this flare. After all, when we do mechanical thrombectomy, also at 18 hours, 20 hours, they are all flare positive at that time. So it's not that all flare positive kill the patient or they bleed it. I think the whole uh, whole concept of flare is that it just tells you the timing. But other than that, so so even if it was the old infarct, but it was so small that you wouldn't expect it to bleed. So I I really. I appreciate of your judgment at that time that you didn't, even though you thought that it was old and fucked, but it was too small. It didn't let you uh, come in the way of uh, your decision. Now, the other interesting thing, which is to be, uh, which can be discussed with the patient, is that you know today we are at a very good situation about this bridging versus mechanical. This recent study which you quoted, what they found is that bridging is better than mechanical. But mechanical alone is also not that bad, so you can now choose your case. What you, either ways you are right. If everything is correct, then go ahead for bridging. And one of the biggest advantage of bridging is what happened in your patient. There's a good chance, particularly if you are in tenecte place, the vessels may get recanalized, and you may you may spare the patient mechanical thrombectomy. That is the advantage of doing bridging. At least 30, 40 percent of patients you you will not even know even even need, and you don't have to wait. 
you do the bridging you do the iv and after that take patient for mechanical but in 30% of cases you will be pleasantly surprised that you don't need it it doesn't matter you come out of the ngo suite so that to, to that extent bridging is good but you know there are some situations where you are afraid of giving iv uh, thrombolysis you know for instance if the patient is having some little bit of bleeding tendency for anywhere uh, or patient has a recent history of recent or a uh, couple of years ago history of any brain hemorrhage or where you you don't want to give iv you want to do mechanical so there the mechanical alone can be given with a reasonably good outcome so all in all i think you have revised all our concepts and you have uh, taken the lead and uh, gone ahead and uh, achieved an excellent outcome fantastic case thank you satyan uh, minakshi so thank you very much sir thanks for the nice comments sir and uh, lovely case really so uh, i think you have got it right and everything has gone well and i should also tell you that you know you are very lucky i'll tell you why because when you have a basilar occlusion i am sure it was the basilar occlusion we look at whether it is a proximal or middle or the distal basilar right yours was a distal basilar sir mid to distal yeah actually i wrong to it is proximal it was mid to distal basilar yeah much the distal proximal uh, half yeah, a centimeter was well visualized usually when you have an embolus on the heart usually it lodges in the distal basilar and these are the patients who will give maximum trouble you have a proximal basilar and mid basilar more often they are not they are atherosclerotic in nature whether is the distal basilar is where the embolus goes and sits and really creates havoc and that's exactly what happens in patients who have got a cardiac thrombosis especially in this low ejection mm. fraction setting when you have the situation we will be lucky if it gets lies away because it's a very fresh clot in within course it is easily lizable and that's why sir said it was very appropriate to choose iv lysis call sir just thought us now because it's going to be easily lies being a fresh clot however if it doesn't open it is going to have the worst prognosis because a major chunk is going to be involved on the other hand when you have a proximal or the mid basilar more often there are their atherosclerotic and what it allows us is that because the occlusion carries on over a period of time it allows us to form more collaterals and therefore it will not be as catastrophic as you will have a distal basilar so we are always worried about distal basilar when it comes these are the patients ultimately we brand them when they don't improve as a progressive basilar artery occlusion and the prognosis becomes very bad for them we are very lucky that with one iv shot it really opened up in fact recanalization was shown by you both the pcas opened up and that's one of the reasons why the recanalization in my opinion was a reason why you got away with it. it's a really good case really you can also go and if possible if you have the images with you you can analyze the there are two things which we can analyze there one is that how good was the collaterals in this patient if there has been a previous ischemia collaterals would be there and that would save the question and there is a posterior circulation collateral score that has been developed all you need to look at is sit with your radiologist and try to visualize the vessels and give some points for instance if you see the ska one point if you see the ica one point if you see the pica one point and then look at the caliber of the posterior communicating artery if it is the same size as normal side then it is 2 if it is reduced it is 1 not seen 0 so with this you can calculate a rough score and the persons who score well in this collateral score are the ones who really are lucky because they do very well after your lysis beat mechanical or iv in fact the difficulty which we face is that most of the studies which we get across are for only anterior circulation whatever data you quoted if you look at that all of them whether it is mr clean study or the swift frame whatever it is the data is from actually the anterior circulation the posterior circulation guidelines are not that dogmatic how it is believed that we should not have any difference of opinion in fact posterior circulation should be given more you know against for us because number one if untreated prognosis will be poor and number two we know that the ischemic window will be longer in the posterior circulation by nature and that's the reason why we have a longer window there are patients who have been thrombolyzed up to 79 hours the initial papers talk about 3 days and still they were taken for mechanical thrombectomy and they did well so these are things which we should learn 
anyway it's a good case and we are very very lucky and showed the patient also with that progressive occlusion still she did well congratulations sir and thank you very much for the lovely presentation yeah other question i had is that uh, since she had 15% ejection fraction uh, what medicine she was on uh, was she on double antiplatelets or single or oral anticoagulants or do you have any information on that yes sir uh, so as i mentioned she was only on single antiplatelet yeah. uh, that was ecosprin and uh, statin uh, rosuvastatin uh, sorry it was statin 20 mg okay okay sir any comment agar regarding that sir no because this is a one of the very this is a unresearched uh, although there are many trials but the final word is not said that what should you do for these patients who are having low ejection fraction as far as the current guidelines go they say that if the patient of the, the current guidelines say if the patient has not had a stroke then you can give them just antiplatelets but if they have now now this patient of course she has atrial fibrillation also i think this current stroke is not because of Uh, so much because of uh, low ef it is because of atrial fibrillation because she has a atrial fibrillation also so i just but suppose if this patient had only ef uh, low and no atrial fibrillation then what is the best strategy for preventing that is still not decided they say for primary prevention you should still give aspirin only but if the patient has already suffered a stroke for secondary prevention then you can give them oral anti but this is a different story because patient had a oral anti had a fibrillation which has been detected only during this stroke probably it was not detected before and maybe it was there present before also so that is why uh, that way that makes it little more interesting but anyway the outcome is very good and that is what matters finally outcome but also if there has been no atrial fibrillation so i don't think he would have used a dabigatron or any of those no ax right sir in in the routine low ejection fraction status as of now no ax have not been you know recommended it's only the uh, vitamin k antagonist if it is but if it is an atrial yeah. fibrillation as you said sir yeah i think they could use either one of them either yeah. single or double and no cardiologist would let them go without two antiplatelets Yeah, because all of them, even for a small ischemic uh, myocardial infarction, means that they always give dual antiplatelet and continuously as ever. Sir, like us, they do not revise it to a single antiplatelet. We have guidelines six weeks, sometimes yeah. three months. But as cardiologists, they just go on with the dual antiplatelet. And many of the patients remain okay for years together. You know, I mean, <laughs> because our complication is because of the past stroke because. part of the brain is friable so they are more prone to bleed that's why we don't want to give it beyond 3 months so yeah. these patients are they suitable for dual pathway inhibitor like rivaroxaban and aspirin something like that that has not been studied in this subgroup of patients that has been studied in compass trial in patients with carotid artery stenosis so we don't know so any comments from dr anand kumar sir Uh, congratulations dr satyan uh, you manage it very well now it's, it's very easy to discuss all those uh, contraindications and how you uh, ruled out one by one uh, but at that moment it was really a, a, a brave decision with full of knowledge you took it very well and you managed it very well and you got a very good outcome the only question i am uh, i want to ask you is why a dose of 0.25 mg per kg was used instead of 0.2 mg per kg because uh, with the recent trauma and the risk of gi bleed uh, secondary to her arthritic colitis i am worried of her uh, uh, only problem or only complication of bleeding if i use a high dose so i will uh, <laughs> consider 0.2 not 0.25 otherwise bridging and everything uh, the same i will consider so only the dose i am uh, just want to know your rational behind it uh basically uh, what is approved in our setting in india is also 0.2 mg per kg but uh, as per the western studies and the trials which are available most of them have switched over to 0.25 mg per kg although as i mentioned at the outset of my presentation also if the patient was on hemodialysis and uh, was uh, this was being used given heparin i might have been contemplated to give 0.2 mg per kg but uh, she had none of those risk factors and the uh, ulcerative colitis was also in remission i decided to go ahead with the full dose of 0.25 mg per kg and if she had a active bleeding gi bleeding then uh, we would consider uh, would mechanical no, no only mechanical directly or 
yes sir i would have definitely considered mm-hmm. the only for that without bridging and no IBT. without i bridging no sir no i bridging thank you congratulations once again thank, thank you thank you